Hi, and welcome back to my videos for Physical Chemistry 1. Today, I want to look more closely at the velocities of the molecules in a gas. Specifically, I want to look at the spread or distribution of velocities. As you can probably guess, the molecules don't all move at the exact same speed. Here's a simulation of the molecules in a gas, color-coded by their speeds. The red and orange ones are the fastest, and the blue ones are the slowest. As you can see, there's a whole range of speeds, with the greenish ones being the most numerous. Knowing the velocity distribution is useful, because it can help us understand the rates of chemical reactions. As you can imagine, the fastest molecules are the most likely to react when they collide, because their energies are more likely to exceed the activation energy for the reaction. You might recall from the previous video that we had this equation for the root mean squared velocity of the molecules. But remember, this velocity is determined using an average of the squared velocity. It doesn't tell us anything about what the range of likely velocities is. So, how can we determine what the distribution of velocities is? Well, to start with, let's think about what a distribution usually looks like. This question was investigated by the German mathematician Carl Gauss. He realized that the property that's randomly distributed around a mean can be described using this basic formula. When we plot this equation, we get what's usually called a bell-shaped curve. It's also called the Gaussian distribution in his honor. But the most common name for it is the normal distribution. This curve has a few properties that will be useful for us to know about. The first of these is the mean. Right now, the curve has a mean of zero, but a real quantity, such as the velocity, may not have a mean of zero. In order to make the mean something else, we need to change the equation to this. The mean is x bar, so when we put in a value for x bar, the distribution shifts to the left or right. For example, here's what we'd get if we used 1 for the mean. Another property that we're interested in is the width of the distribution. That depends on the standard deviation of the values that we're measuring. Right now, the standard deviation is set to 1, but it could be larger or smaller than that. To take this into account, we need to change our equation so that it includes the standard deviation, which gives us this. So, if our data has a smaller standard deviation, such as 0.5, the equation would have 0.5 in the denominator of the exponent, and the curve would be this. The last property of a normal distribution is its amplitude. Right now, the height of this curve is 1. But we can make it higher or lower by altering the equation so that it has a constant out front. This is called the amplitude of the curve. And if we change it to 0.5, the height of the curve decreases to 0.5, like this. So, the three properties of a normal distribution are its mean, its standard deviation, and its amplitude. So, how do we use this to describe the velocity distribution of the molecules in a gas? Well, one person who was interested in the velocities of molecules was James Clerk Maxwell, the same physicist who worked on the theory of electromagnetism. He guessed that the velocities of molecules would follow a normal distribution, so he wrote the equation this way. This gives the distribution of velocities in the x direction, and the function a is related to the standard deviation. For reasons we'll get to in a moment, the actual velocity distribution that he determined is more complicated than this, but we can still learn some interesting things from this distribution. For example, here's the velocity distribution for methane molecules at a variety of temperatures. Notice that at the highest temperature, the distribution has the greatest width. This makes sense because at higher temperatures, the molecules should be capable of moving at higher velocities. So there's a greater probability that the molecules will have high speeds in the positive or negative x directions. Meanwhile, as the temperature decreases, the distribution gets narrower, so the velocities tend to cluster closer to 0 meters per second. This too makes sense. As the temperature decreases, the molecules move more slowly. At a temperature of absolute zero, the molecules should all theoretically stop moving, so the distribution would simply be a vertical line at zero. Here's another series of plots. This time, 
all the plots were calculated for the same temperature, 300 Kelvin. Notice that the distribution is widest for the hydrogen and narrowest for carbon dioxide. This time, the factor that makes the difference is the mass of the molecules. Carbon dioxide is the heaviest molecule, so it moves the slowest, whereas hydrogen is the lightest molecule and therefore is able to reach higher velocities at the same temperature. So, what does all this tell us? For one thing, it means that the function A must involve both the temperature and the mass of the molecules, since both of those properties affect the width of the distribution. But unfortunately, there's also a feature of these curves that's not very realistic, and it's something that James Maxwell thought deeply about in order to understand how to make a more accurate equation for the velocity distribution. Notice that all the curves have their maxima at zero meters per second. In a way, that makes sense, because there should be just as many molecules moving in the positive x direction as in the negative x direction, so it's true that the average of those velocities would be zero. However, the molecules in a gas all move with a fairly high velocity in whatever direction they're headed. Almost none of them actually have a velocity of zero. That would mean that they're standing still, and molecules in a gas hardly ever do that at normal temperatures. However, these plots make it look like zero is the most likely velocity for a molecule. To solve this difficulty, Maxwell was able to use some simple but clever mathematics. Here's how. Let's think about what the y-axis of these plots means. This axis represents a relative probability that a molecule will have a velocity described on the x-axis. We can write that as an equation this way. The probability that a molecule will have a velocity vx is proportional to the exponential term we've been looking at. But why is the probability proportional to that term and not equal to it? The reason is that the probabilities for each velocity must add up to 1. If we use an equal sign, we're saying that the amplitude is equal to 1, which means that the height of the curve would be 1, but that can't be correct. Instead, we need to scale the curve by giving it an amplitude that we'll call capital A. The sum of all the probabilities for this distribution must be 1, and we can write that using this equation. This is equivalent to saying that the area under the curve described by the normal distribution must be equal to 1. There are a couple of things to notice about this integral. First, notice that the variable is vx, so that's what we're taking the integral with respect to. Also, the limits of the integral are equal to positive and negative infinity. That's because there's technically no limit to the possible velocities that a molecule could have, regardless of the temperature. In reality, the curve approaches zero pretty quickly, but it still never actually reaches zero. Also, remember that we put the amplitude a in the equation so that the area under the curve would be equal to 1. That's actually what makes this a normal distribution. The area under a normal distribution is always equal to 1. For that reason, this amplitude a is called the normalization constant. So, our task now is to try and figure out what exactly little a and capital A are equal to. We know that little a will depend on the temperature and the mass of the molecules, and capital A will be a constant. Once we know what they are, we'll have an equation that tells us exactly what the distribution of velocities is. To do it, we need to solve this integral. First, remember that the distribution is symmetric and is centered at zero. You might recall from your calculus course that this means that we can simplify the integral a little by making the limits zero and infinity and doubling the result. Also, remember that capital A is a constant, so we're able to move that out of the integral. It turns out that this definite integral has a known solution. If you check a good table of integrals, you'll find out that the solution to the integral is this. If we plug that into the equation, the 2's cancel, and we find that 1 is equal to capital A times the square root of pi over little a.
If we solve this for capital A, we find that big A is equal to the square root of little a over pi. Now we can plug that back into our equation for the probability, which gives us this. The purpose of doing all that was to reduce the number of unknowns in our probability equation from 2, capital A and little a, to just 1. Now we just need to find out what little a is equal to, and we'll have an equation for the velocity distribution. Before we move on, let's remember that this equation just describes the velocity distribution in the x direction. We'd really like to know what the overall velocity distribution is, not just the velocity along the x-axis. To get the probability for the overall velocity, we just need to multiply the probabilities along the x, y, and z axes. If we substitute the expressions for the probability for each of those directions, we get this. We can simplify this a bit by multiplying the three square root terms together, and also by combining the three exponential terms. Now this equation that we've arrived at is a perfectly correct equation for the velocity distribution. But it would be kind of difficult to use it the way that we've written it. That's because it's very challenging to measure the velocities in the x, y, and z directions separately. It would be much easier if we could just use v, the overall velocity, without having to worry about the directions. It turns out that we can do that. But in order to do it, we'll need to switch from Cartesian coordinates to spherical coordinates, and then integrate the resulting expression over the angles theta and phi. The reason we do that is because we don't really care at what angle the molecules are located relative to the origin of the coordinate system. When we perform the integral with respect to theta and phi, we'll eliminate those two variables from the equation. I'm actually going to skip those two steps, because changing the coordinate system from Cartesian to spherical is a fairly lengthy process. But when we do it, and the integration is finished, here's the equation we end up with. Notice that both sides of the equation include dv. We'll need to get rid of those, which means we need to take the integral with respect to v, the overall velocity. But let's not simply take the integral of this equation. Instead, let's find an equation that tells us the average velocity. That'll be even more useful. In order to get that, we'll start with a basic fact you might have learned in your probability course. It turns out that if we have a function of x, and we want to know the average value, we can get it using this formula. We get the average of f by just integrating f times the probability distribution. So, if we want to know the average of the squared velocity, it'll be the integral of v squared times the probability distribution of v. Let's solve it. First, we need to know what the limits of the integral are. In spherical coordinates, the velocity can range from 0 up to infinity, so those will be our limits. Next, let's look at this probability. The probability here is the probability that our molecule has the velocity v. We already got an expression for that probability, which is this. If we plug that into our equation for the average v squared, here's what we get. Let's simplify this a bit by combining the two v squared terms. And next, let's take all the constants out of the integral. So, this equation tells us the average of the squared velocity is equal to this constant times the integral. Now we need to solve the integral. This is another definite integral whose solution is known, and if we look in a table of integrals, here's what we'll find. This is pretty complex looking, but if we compare this integral to the one in our equation, you can see that little n must be equal to 2, and the x corresponds to v in our equation. That means the solution to the integral must be 4 factorial over 2 factorial times 2 to the fifth power times the square root of pi over a to the fifth power. We can simplify that quite a bit. First, this fraction is just equal to 3 eighths. 
Now, the expression we have left simplifies to the average square velocity on the left side and 3 over 2a on the right. So, we now have a very simple expression for the average square velocity. But wait, in the previous video we already determined an expression for the average square velocity. Here it is. If we set these two expressions equal to each other, here's what we'll get. But notice what this equation is telling us. The temperature and molecular mass of the gas are both easy to determine, so the only variable we don't know is A. That means if we solve this equation for A, we'll finally know what A is equal to. If we do that, here's what we get. A is just equal to the molecular mass over 2 times RT. So, we finally have an expression for A, and just as we expected, it depends on both temperature and the molecular mass. If we plug this into our equation for the velocity distribution, here's what we get. This is a very important result, and it's what we've been leading up to. We now have an equation that tells us the probability that a gas molecule will have any given velocity. All we need to know is the temperature and the molecular mass. Everything else in this equation is a constant. This velocity distribution is called the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution, and it gets used in many places in physics and chemistry. It's one of the most significant results in the field of study called statistical thermodynamics. Let's see what we get when we plot this equation. Here's the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution for the first six inert gases from the last column of the periodic table. At first, these look just like normal distributions that we saw earlier, but these have some significant differences that make them much more realistic than a simple normal distribution. First of all, the means are different for each of the curves. As you can see, the velocity for helium has a much higher mean value than for heavier gases. That makes sense, because we expect that light atoms will move faster than heavy ones. This is much different than the normal distributions we saw earlier, where the mean was exactly 0 meters per second. Another significant difference between these curves and ordinary normal distributions is that, although the curve approaches 0 infinitely slowly on the right side, the curve actually does reach 0 on the left side, where the velocity is 0. This satisfies our expectation that molecules in a gas are continually in motion, and they don't ever have a velocity of exactly zero. Well, that's enough new material for now. The Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution has lots of applications and was a big result for us in this video. We'll start exploring the applications of it in the next video. I hope you'll join me for that. But until then, have a good week.